The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Canavan, which is also shown at item 14 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? E excellent. Okay. All right, everybody sit down. Um, I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Canavan. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, some might still say the, the government is in its honeymoon period. Uh, uh, it has uh, broken more promises uh, uh, than any newlywed in history. Uh, in just 10 months, in just 10 months as a government, only 10 months since the election, I've got a list here of 10 broken promises from this government. Ten broken promises, one for each month they have been in government. They're not little promises either, they're not small ones, uh, but they were all sweet nothings that the Labor Party whispered to the Australian people uh, over a year ago during the election campaign to reassure them, to tell them uh, that they thought they would deliver for them. And instead, instead they, the Australian people have been completely dudded and these promises have been completely broken. At the top of this list was their long, oft-repeated pro pro promise to cut people's power bills by $275 a year. In fact, Mr Acting Deputy President, the now Prime Minister made that promise 97 times before the election. 97 times did Anthony Albanese say to the Australian people, he would cut your power bills by $275. Guess how many times he's made that promise or repeated that promise since the election? Guess how many? Zero. Nada. Zilch. He doesn't mention it anymore. It was something, as I say, it was a sweet nothing said before the Australian people walked down the aisle with the Australian Labor Party. And once the vows were, were, were said, once the rings were on the finger, he has completely <laughs> forgotten about it as if he never said it before. Because we all know, I don't know if you've opened up a power bill in recent months. They certainly haven't gone down by $275. My power bill hasn't. It's skyrocketed up in the opposite direction. And now the Labor Party won't even give an inch of uh, support to the fact that they've made this promise. The Labor Party also said there'd be no changes to superannuation. The Prime Minister said that on radio many times, said he had no plans. We, he said on the 31st of January last year, we have not planned for changes on superannuation. Well, the last two weeks, of course, we've seen a doubling of superannuation tax rates. Uh, for now we know 10 per cent of Australians, thanks only to the Senate yesterday, we know 10 per cent of Australians. The, the, the uh, Prime Minister, now Prime Minister, also, also, also said that he would increase real wages for the Australian people, increase real wages. In fact, a couple of weeks ago it was confirmed we've had the biggest reduction in real wages on record, in record, on recorded history. Another promise broken from this Prime Minister. We had a promise that there'd be no increase in the tax burden, as I said. That has already been breached, already been breached by the superannuation promise, but we've also had a treasurer out there in the last couple of weeks saying that he might tax the family home too. He hasn't ruled that out of uh, contention. Well, who knows? Who knows? Who would know? Who could trust you what you say today when what you said last year you're definitely not keeping up with now? The, the Australian Labor Party also promised that people's franking credits wouldn't be touched. Yeah. Remember that? They wouldn't be touched. And now we learn this week they're back on the agenda to be taxed. Uh, this is uh, when the Australian people elected the Labor Party last year. They thought they were getting Anthony Albanese as prime minister. In fact, they're actually getting Bill Shorten because all of these policies are what Bill Shorten took to the 2019 election, uh, and the Labor Party tried to drop and hide for the 2022 election. But Bill Shorten is back. He is back with his agenda uh, of taxing uh, superannuation, uh, uh, taxing uh, uh, franking credits, and, and we, we, we expect probably in the future they'll be taxing the family home, taxing investment properties as well, just like the Labor Party wanted to do in 2019, which was rejected. The Labor Party also said there'd be no return to industry-wide bargaining. Well, that was removed late last year. That, another promise broken just before Christmas. They promised wage rises for aged care workers. Well, they're like the rest of us, seeing our real wages go down. The, the Australian Labor Party, Bill Shorten, oh, sorry, well, Bill Shorten, not Mr. Bill Shorten, Mr. Anthony Albanese, promised promised that he would, he would deliver cheaper mortgages for the Australian people. He promised cheaper mortgages and then today, just in the last couple of hours, we've seen the tenth increase in interest rates, nine on this government's watch, nine interest rate increases in the space of ten months from this government after promises of cheaper mortgages. He would be finally, he finally promised that Australian families would be better off and clearly with rising interest rates, rising power prices, uh, uh, increasing taxes. 
Australian families are not they are better off than this government. No one could make that claim. Now, they, they, my, my uh, opponents here will get up and say, oh, there was all these problems. We've had the Ukraine war. We've had all these things. Guess when Ukraine was invaded? February last year, three months before the election. It happened then. Uh, guess when inflation started peaking? It was about 18 months ago. He should have known that then. The Labor Party knew they were telling fibs to the Australian people a year ago. They tried to hide it. It's been exposed. And now they've got a litany of broken promises that are going to be held around their neck until the Australian people have their say on how they think uh, broken promises should be treated in two years' time at the next election. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Polly. What a desperately written MPI from an opposition that couldn't even navigate their way back to port in calm waters, let alone when there's been a storm. Public trust in government has been at the all-time low after a decade, oh, a decade oh, of no. the Liberal coalition government. I will put up Anthony Albanese as the PM against Scott Morrison any day, any day at all. And the Australian people finally saw through the Liberal coalition under Scott Morrison for their rorts, dishonesty and lies. They made their judgment based on what they had experienced for over a decade. They, they were caught out time and time again for the lies, the corruption, the, reward, the rorts of grants. That is what this opposition will be remembered for for some time to come. But it's unfortunate, very unfortunate, that those opposite have the audacity to come in here and make these claims in relation to broken promises when, in fact, the Australian people still see us as the government of hope, the government that will put their interests first, a government where they know the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister, not a Prime Minister who tries oh, to sorry, take me, on Senator, other ministers' Senator portfolios. Polly. Thank you. Uh, Senator um, Hughes, yes. And I nearly said, Madam Deputy Chair, for that. <laughs> Mr Deputy Chair, a point of order on relevance. Mm. It's not addressing the question at all that was put by Senator Canavan. If you could bring Senator Polly back to what the actual urgency motion is. Thank you, Senator Hughes. It is a wide-ranging debate, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Senator Polly has addressed the issue and will continue to address the issue. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, for your protection from you always know, you always know when you're hitting a nerve when they take frivolous points of order that has no relevance whatsoever. But this gives me the opportunity to continue to talk about the trillion dollar debt that those opposite left the Australian government of today. It's not just the problem of the Australian government, it's actually Australian people's debt that we have inherited from a lacklustre, dishonest, rotting government. They're the facts, so it doesn't matter how many times those opposite come into the chamber and want to rewrite history and make everyone feel that they've been, uh, they haven't been uh, looked after or the promises that we made at election times have not been committed. They know that they have cheaper medicines. They know that they have affordable childcare. They know oh, that oh, no. we will be addressing climate change. They also know that there's 180,000 free fee TAFE places, something that this government we're very proud of the fact that they were running down tapes with their state colleagues in Tasmania and the coalition government, who obviously did nothing about building Australia's skills. They have done nothing to protect manufacturing in this country. Not a thing. What we have seen under the former government was manufacturer after manufacturer leaving this country going overseas. Why? Because they never were on the job. And now they come in here and bleat about 0.5 per cent of the population who have $3 million in their superannuation fund. They want to speak up their crying crocodile tears for those people, but they don't give a damn about the average Australian who has $120,000 or less in their superannuation. Never hear those opposite 
come in defending Australian workers, we saw them do nothing to address the concerns and the crisis in aged care when we can't get people to work in aged care. We didn't see them doing anything about legislating to bring more nurses back into aged care. We heard absolutely nothing. We heard nothing for them when it came to instilling uh, the support of their government to skill up Australians. They did nothing for low pay workers and they come in here now and trying to rewrite history. Well, the Australian people saw through them. They are still seeing them for what they were. And I will guarantee one thing about history will actually hold Anthony Albanese as the Labor Prime Minister of this country in much better esteem than the history will ever show of Scott Morrison and his government and the rorting dishonesty and the fact that he had so much faith in his colleagues, in his ministerial colleagues, he took over responsibility for their portfolios. I mean, come on, give me a break. Give me a break. It is just ludicrous for those people to come in here and try and defend their record, the record of rorters, cheats and people thank who you, are dishonest with you, the Australian thank people. You, Senator. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people across Queensland and who make up our amazing Queensland community, I'm speaking to Senator Canavan's motion, Matter of Public Importance. This MPI quite fairly criticises the Albanese Labor government for their record of broken promises already, including a promise not to raise taxation and a promise not to change superannuation. The Prime Minister is now raising tax on unrealised earnings of large superannuation funds. Oh, way to go! Labor are running a two-for-one sale on broken promises, just in time for the New South Wales state election, where five and a half million voters are going to ask themselves, do I trust Labor with government? Will they keep their promises? To be fair, the Albanese government has not resorted to dividing promises yet into core and non-core promises, non promises yet. But wait, it's early days, and the promise to bring down the cost of living is already broken. Today, Brisbane's Courier Mail newspaper reported that an average household in Queensland now has to spend an additional $1,150 a month to pay their bills and keep a roof over their head. $1,150 is a hell of a lot of money for everyday Australians to find every month. The Labor government is wrongly trying to blame international pressures for gas price rises. Gas was already increasing rapidly before the Ukraine conflict. The gas price rise has nothing to do with war between countries and everything to do with the war on coal. As the government closes down energy-intensive coal power and introduces more weather-dependent solar and wind power, the grid needs more and more gas to firm the supply and maintain reliable power. Household gas is costing more as large electricity generators bid in the market for the gas they need to keep the electricity grid functioning. Increasing gas prices is demand inflation. Housing price rises are demand inflation. 400,000 new Australians arrived in the last 12 months. 400,000, all needing houses in which to live. Of course the price was going to rise. No wonder the Albanese government changed their election promise from cheaper power to power going up less quickly. Every cool room on every farm and dairy, in every coal store and every supermarket is now more expensive to run. Every bakery, restaurant, butcher and, and every store and every shopping centre is passing on huge increases in power prices. Mortgage payments, repayments are rising because the previous government's money printing caused increasing interest rates. Labor went right along with them with those measures and is equally to blame for the inflation that that's now caused. Last week, Treasurer Jim Chalmers recklessly, wrongly, uncaringly claimed the worst of inflation is over. Oh really? On what basis? New South Wales voters should not believe that for a moment. Inflation is a direct result of this government's core energy and spending policies. And this government is not going away until 2025. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, of course, I might just begin by saying, of course, we have to discount a motion coming from the Liberal National Party around broken promises. Uh, a, a party that seems to think it's OK to lie to the Australian people to maintain cabinet confidence, which of course we've just found out about in recent days. But I do want to say to the Labor Party, uh, if the safeguard mechanism that you are bringing to parliament is your plan for climate action in this parliament, that will be a broken promise. 
to the millions of Australians who gave you and the Greens and the crossbench a mandate for change in this parliament at this really important and absolutely critical time of history. If the best we're going to get is a, an ex-Tony Abbott scheme uh, adopted from the Liberal Party and from Angus Taylor, uh, if that's the best we're going to get, Australians are going to be bitterly disappointed. And they will see this as a broken promise when you campaigned on climate action. But that's OK, because the Greens are here to help. We're here to help. Uh, it, might be a thin, it might feel like a thin green line some days, but we are here to hold that line for the millions of Australians who voted for climate action and make sure that we do put our communities, uh, our country and nature first and make sure that we actually get an outcome on reducing emissions. Because the legislation that you are bringing to parliament that we've had a good look at now does nothing to reduce emissions. It does nothing to act on our climate emergency. You can't fix a problem by making it worse. And this is the greatest challenge of our time. Guess who said that? Yep, an ex-Labor Prime Minister. Well, this is a chance to fix it, and we're happy to work with you to make sure we have no new Order. fossil fuel Senator projects Wilson, in this country. Expired. Senator Bragg. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, there are so many broken promises here to choose from, but so little time to speak. So it is very regrettable that there isn't more time. But I think just for the uh, enjoyment of the chamber, I'll just focus on a couple that are, are known to me in some, some level of detail. Now, um, in the 2019 election, there was a policy statement by the Labor Party that it would turn off refundable uh, offsets and thereby effectively destroy franking credits for many retirees. Now, this was an agenda that was put forward by Mr Bowen, Minister Bowen now, and he said famously in a radio interview in Sydney that if people didn't like that policy, uh, they should vote for the coalition effectively. And that's what people did in 2019. And of course, this time uh, they've come back and tried to attack franking again. Now, franking is a policy that the Treasury probably doesn't like, and I'm sure that the Treasury advice to the government is that they uh, should try and damage franking, uh, much to the chagrin of former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Uh, but rather than being upfront with the Australian people and saying, look, we want to stuff franking, uh, the Labor Party said they wouldn't touch franking. And in fact, uh, the quotes here are really quite, quite good. On the 4th of March 2022, Mr Albanese said in Perth that they are not touching them when referring to franking credits. And then just two weeks later, he said, that Labor won't have any changes to the franking credits regime. And then, of course, the Treasurer, or the now Treasurer Jim Chalmers, told Queenslanders that when it came to tax, we won't be, ta we won't be doing franking credits. We won't be doing them. I couldn't be clearer than that. Well, he's certainly doing them. He's doing them over. Uh, and what you've now seen is a very sneaky, underhanded way of taking on franking credits. Uh, rather than removing the ability of the funds to receive them, uh, they're trying to turn them off from the corporate end uh, and thereby trapping $86 billion in uh, credits on, ba on balance sheets today. So um, it, it's very interesting. If you read the explanatory memorandum, it says, if any entity has never previously made a dis distribution, then the entity will not have a practice of making distributions. And that is the key test in this bill, uh, that it will effectively stuff franking by removing the ability of a company to pay a frank dividend when they've capital raised at any, any point in the past, possibly. The, the link between a company raising equity and then paying a distribution uh, is going to be there in the bill. Therefore, the whole franking system is frankly at risk. And this could have very serious consequences for Australia as a competitive jurisdiction. Uh, it'll be less likely that people will invest in Australian companies. It'll be harder for Australian companies to raise equity, and Australian companies will be more reliant on debt as a result of this change. So, but the political point here is that the government should have been up front and said, look, we are going to change franking, uh, but instead they wrapped themselves in these promises. So very disappointing. And secondly, whilst the time uh, is remaining, uh, I do want to talk about the, the other broader promise that was made 
here not to touch super. So hilariously, uh, there's a gentleman in the House called Mr Stephen Jones, he's the Assistant Treasurer, and he gave an address to the 2022 SMSF Association where he said, Anthony Albanese wanted me to deliver a particular message to everyone in the sector today, and it's about stability and certainty. And he says, we want you to have peace of mind in retirement. We want you to make the case that your nest egg, your retirement savings are always going to be safer under Labor. There you go. You couldn't make it up. That's a good quote, isn't it? So um, basically, um, all, all the government has done since the election has been to move the goalposts. Um, clearly, there's been an agenda to try and feather the nests of their favourite rent seekers. But in relation to the substantial tax change, uh, that is really going to be a significant change to the system over the long term, because over the long term, it's going to be younger Australians that will pay a much higher level of tax. Now, yesterday we heard in this chamber that 10 per cent of people would be hit by the tax uh, over the long term, and in the short term, uh, it will be about 100,000 people. But the point is, if you've gone to an election saying you won't change the tax settings on super and your promises last less than a year, uh, it shows that breaking promises is part of your DNA. And whether it's in this policy area or on climate or a range of other uh, things across the board, uh, the government has shown itself to be very unreliable when it comes to making promises and keeping them. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It's unbelievably galling to be lectured by those opposite on broken promises. And they've and the ridiculousness of it is they actually made an art form of breaking promise after promise. Go, uh, Tony Abbott, on the election eve in 2013, no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no cuts to the ABC or SBS. And I'll take that interjection from Senator Bragg as he leaves the chamber. Yeah, it was 10 years ago, and then you just got better at lying over the 10 years. It got um, worse order, and worse Senator and worse. Senator O'Neill, uh, Senator Hughes. That was uh, disparaging of a... Of a Colleague, if we could ask, uh, can we ask that to be withdrawn? Um, Senator O'Neill, I will remind you uh, that it is disorderly to. Uh, cast aspersions on reasons why senators might be leaving the chamber during your remarks. So I will remind you of that uh, in making your contribution. Um, I, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I, I didn't know that was the bit that was offensive. I thought it was. The, I thought you were taking uh, umbrage at me actually calling the former prime minister a liar. But if this is just about Senator Bragg leaving the chamber, uh, that's okay. Senator O'Neill, I would also remind you that it is best to be careful when using that particular word in reference to. Other members of the parliament, please continue your remarks. So, 10 years, you know, it made an art form of it. $4.7 billion in funding to universities, cuts hundreds of jobs to ABC, SBS, scrapped the last two years of the Gonski reforms. And that was just the warm ups. It just got worse and worse and worse. Billions and billions in entrenched cuts that devastated the services that everyday Australians rely on, including the $56 billion tearing up of the National Health Partnership Agreement. And ask any Australian, how hard is it now to get into a doctor? They were the kind of broken promises that we saw day after day, year after year, nine wasted years in Australia's history when we could have been really advancing on so many fronts. Mr Morrison. The PM with so many portfolios, he failed to do his jail job and failed to fulfil his promises. He promised a religious discrimination bill, with his own party revolting against it. He promised a National Integrity Commission. He didn't even get up to bringing it into the parliament, didn't even introduce it to the House. I haven't got enough time to list the litany of pretenses that was the former government. So I'm absolutely not going to take any notice of the crocodile tears from those opposite when they come in here and talk about broken promises. It's a joke to see the coalition going into bat for the richest superannuation holders in Australia at the very same time as the scandalous robo-debt program that they instituted is unfolding before the eyes of Australians in the Royal Commission. Minister after minister, day after day, admitting to covering up systemic theft, illegally raising debts against their own people, 
and they dare to come in here and have a go at a government that's actually making a positive difference in the lives of Australians. Let me tell you, when I'm out there, people are saying to me, I'm so relieved. I am so relieved to wake up in the morning and not feel like there's a disaster landing on my head, because that was the characteristic of the former government. People know that the former government were happy to send illegal debt notices out to hundreds of thousands of Australians, hound them with debt collectors and then systematically lie and bully their way out of accountability for this tragedy, supposedly to improve the budget, budget bottom line. Yet they've left Australian taxpayers with a trillion dollars in debt. That's their record on economic reality, in economic realities. Now, Labor instead is undertaking a responsible cabinet-style government, not seen in generations here, orderly, predictable, making sure that we bring Australians along with us on facing the challenges that we face. The world changes and our world needs a careful response from the government who pays attention to the detail. We know that fair and sensible measures need to be undertaken to restore our nation's finances. Those opposite think it's just fine for those people with millions and millions of dollars in super to actually pay a smaller marginal tax rate than a pay-as-you-go earner on a $44,000 a year salary. And they think it's fine to borrow billions of dollars to keep those tax arrangements in super for people who have balances over $3 million in place. Now, I love the endeavour of people who get into business and create jobs and get the benefits of business. And if you've got $3 million in super, good on you. But if you've got more than $3 million in super, I don't think you should be getting a tax break, more than has been applied in this option of 30 cents in the dollar. I think there are people in your community who probably need to be able to see a doctor. I think people need services from this government. And the people need services a lot more than somebody with $3 million needing the protection of those opposite who are standing up for 0.5 per cent of Australians who are clearly not doing it that tough. Now We're going to continue on with our plan to support workers, families and small businesses. Cheaper medicines, cheaper childcare, wage growth, no more, no, more, more paternal leave, more, more paid parental leave, game-changing reforms that are Order, real and will Senator make a difference to the bottom of line of families across has Australia. Expired. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Now, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was elected to government in no small part, no small part, because he insisted that his government would be one of integrity. In Feb 2021, Mr Albanese told the nation it's time to bring integrity back to politics. Well, it's been almost a year now and we're still waiting. Where's the integrity? Should we expect integrity anytime soon? Will Mr Albanese bring it back this year, perhaps next year? Perhaps in 2024, that's when we'll see the integrity. Now, don't tell us that the war in Ukraine means that the government can't do integrity anymore because we've used that in this place as an excuse for absolutely everything else. Or is integrity something that he needs the crossbench to support to deliver? Well, good luck getting the teals to agree to that one. And you know what's funny? You know what's funny? The only thing that Mr. Albanese, that Mr Albanese talked about more pre-election, more than integrity, was $275 off your power bill. Well, almost a year in, we're still waiting to see a sign of integrity and, of course, the cuts to power bills are nowhere to be seen. Perhaps when the PM promised integrity, what he actually meant was dishonesty. Like when he promised for $275 cut to power bills, he made that promise, might I remind everyone in here, 97 times. Maybe he actually meant rises in power bills, not cuts. Kind of like when he promised no changes to super. That's what he promised. Maybe what he meant was changes to super. Much like when he promised that Labor had a, had a plan, a clear plan for cheaper mortgages. Maybe he meant that the Labor Party would preside over 10 consecutive interest rate rises now. 10. Less than 12 months into the Albanese government, we are actually seeing quite a clear pattern. The government promises one thing, and the government goes and does something else. Now, how's that for integrity? They say, they say this. 
but they go and do that. Now, the Prime Minister says you can absolutely, most definitely, rule out changes to capital gains tax on the family home, just like he, just like he said, you can rule out changes on superannuation, and then he goes and announces changes to so superannuation and he doubles the tax rate. Why would you believe a word that this government says? Meanwhile, the Deputy Prime Minister he was so confused by the constant changes to super policy, a policy that, of course, we were assured before the election wouldn't happen, that he couldn't answer basic questions when he was on Sky News recently with Peter Stefanovic. No wonder the Deputy PM was confused. He has no more faith in his government and the policies than the rest of us do. Now, it takes a special kind of dishonesty to promise integrity and then break so many promises to the people that believe the claims of integrity. Now, Mr Albanese, he can, he can sure walk across the Harbour Bridge in a pride march, but you know what he can't do? He can't walk in a straight line. That's what he can't do. Now, the Treasurer, Super Jim Chalmers, can write 6,000 words on remaking capitalism. That's what he did but he'd be hard-pressed to write 60 words on what it means to operate with integrity. It's time that we bring integrity back to politics, Mr Albanese. It's time. We're all waiting for it. We're waiting for integrity from your government, the same way that uh, Mr Chris Bowen is patiently waiting for his taxpayer-funded Tesla. That's what he's waiting for. We're waiting for integrity from this government in the exact same way that Tanya Plibersek is patiently waiting for her chance to assume the top job. Actually, the way this government's going, there is far more chance of seeing that than of seeing any integrity. Mr Albanese, he started with so much promise. What a pity he hasn't kept any of them. Does Mr Albanese not understand that democratic nations run on trust? The citizenry grant permission to government to exercise authority in exchange for a government's commitment to act honestly and to act fairly. That's the deal. And Mr Albanese, he has trashed that deal in less than 12 months. The litany of broken promises shows us all that. Next election, vote differently. Thank you, Senator Babette. And with that, the time for the discussion on the MPI has expired. I shall now